Customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you are a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. Welcome, revolutionaries, to another episode of the Customer Service Revolution podcast. I am John D. Julius. Chief Revolution Officer of the DeJulius Group. The DeJulius Group is changing the world by creating a customer and employee experience revolution. On February 28th and 29th, the DeJulius Group is offering a workshop that is open to the public titled Presentation Skills to Get Ahead in the Corporate World. Being a great leader entails being able to inspire and get everyone in your organization to rally around a common purpose and ignite their passion to execute your vision. Being a great presenter involves a combination of skills, techniques, and personal attributes. In this two-day workshop in Cleveland, Ohio, you will learn the keys on how to nail your next presentation. Presenting ideas and sharing your message well is vital to career growth and corporate success. In this two-day workshop, we will cover how to put together and deliver a great presentation, the five elements of a great presentation, preparation, having more confidence in front of your audience, present clearer and more concise creating engagement with your audience, storytelling, effective use of visual aids, passion and enthusiasm, good timing and pacing. Visit thedjuliusgroup.com forward slash presentation skills today. Don't wait. The spots are limited for this presentation skills workshop. On today's episode, I talked to Alex Gertzberg, who is managing partner of Gertzberg Lakata Law Firm. Besides being a lawyer for over 20 years, Alex is an entrepreneur who owns multiple businesses and is an author. Alex's exceptional background includes serving in Iraq, and all these experiences have instilled in him a strong sense of discipline, integrity, and leadership. Alex has been selected consistently as a super lawyer since 2016. All right, before we get into the interview with Alex, let's think about the last time you or your employees made someone's day. It could have been something so simple, but it was clearly a surprising wow moment for the other person, leaving a positive impression on them. Yet, at the end of the day, who felt the best? You did. The daymaker always feels the best at the end of the day. And that is exactly what world-class customer experience brands do. They build, encourage, and recognize employees who constantly go above and beyond. This is why these brands consistently have the highest employee engagement. Building an above and beyond culture will drive your employee engagement. I like to call it the daymaker dopamine which refers to a phenomenon often discussed in psychology and neuroscience. When we engage in acts of kindness or altruism, it can lead to a release of dopamine, a neurotransmitter associated with the pleasure and reward center in our brain. This effect has been referred to as the helper's eye and has been studied in the context of why people feel so good when they help others. The idea is that engaging altruism behavior activates the reward centers in our brain, leading to the release of dopamine, which in turn creates a feeling of pleasure and satisfaction. And as it turns out, this is a key driver in both employee satisfaction and best-in-class customer experience. The ability to go above and beyond for customers and coworkers alike allows your employees to put their unique fingerprint on the experience they are delivering. This fosters creative autonomy, allowing them to come up with their own ideas and exercise their brains in a way that they hadn't before. 
giving them a sense of ownership in the experience they provide beyond a basic sense of responsibility. Employees are more connected to the experience they are providing when they feel that they have a hand in creating it. For a strong company culture and the strongest impact employee engagement, leaders need to make employees feel safe in always doing the right thing giving them that autonomy. Best of all, when your employees perform an act of kindness, they experience an increase in oxytocin, the chemical that makes us feel warm and fuzzy. We even get it when we hear a story of generosity or when we witness it. It makes us want to be more generous. That is why storytelling and sharing all the great things your team members do for customers and each other is so critically important as a leader and an organization. Organizations achieve greatness when employees are allowed to do unexpected things. Show initiative and creative thinking, and they can step outside the norm. This is when delightful, interesting, and amazing results occur. We will be right back with our interview with Alex Gertzberg after this. My CX Trainer is a new product that the DeJulius Group has just launched. My CX Trainer was designed to help organizations onboard new and existing team members on delivering a world-class customer experience through online videos presented by the DeJulius Group consultants. Quickly, get your team members to understand the impact that they have on the customer. Identify what your customers can always and never expect when doing business with you and generate new ideas for today's environment. My CX Trainer helps you develop ways to personalize service for your customers Understand the difference between service and experience and find ways to go above and beyond for your customers. Become a zero risk business to do business with and overcome customer challenges. Visit the DeJuliusGroup.com forward slash my CX trainer to learn more about adding my CX trainer to your employee onboarding. Welcome back, revolutionaries. And today I'm excited to be talking to Alex Gertzberg, managing partner of Gertzberg Lakata Law Firm. Besides being a lawyer for over two decades, Alex is an entrepreneur who owns multiple businesses and a author. Alex's exceptional background includes serving in Iraq. These experiences have instilled in him a strong sense of discipline, integrity, and leadership. I have known Alex for a long time and gotten to know him and just really like him as a thought leader, as a uh, an entrepreneur, and just as, as a human being. Alex has also been consistently selected as a super lawyer for the last seven or eight years. So let's start with that. Alex, what is a super lawyer? Do you have an S on your chest? I have a cape. I have a cape. I, I wear red underwear. I wear, <laughs> yeah, and I, I go flying. Yeah, That's I mean, cool. Like, That's like, cool. How yeah, you doing, Alex? Uh, I'm good, man. I'm good, John. How are you? Thank you for having me on your podcast. I, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm excited to talk about a lot of things today. One of the things, I don't know if you ever read, but I, I wrote a, an article on, well, no, before I get to that, tell our listeners what your background is. Uh, you know, I, I didn't even, I, I'm sure you've told me uh, several times, but as we were discussing our ADD thing, <laughs> but ADD is nice, especially if you, if you have a, a a prescription from the doctor. So whenever, you know, my fiance yells at me about something, I just hold up the prescription. I got ADD, ADD. right? Sure. Stop yelling at me. I got ADD. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So tell, tell us our listeners uh, about your yeah. background, how you got where you are today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll give you the short version. Uh, I'm an immigrant. I was born in Moldova. You know where Moldova is? No, Nobody where's ever. Moldova? It's right next to Russia, the Ukraine, and Romania. Wow. Uh, it's this little sliver of country that Putin actually invaded many years ago. I was born there. I came here when I was four years old with my family. And here is East Side Cleveland. of Cleveland. Yeah. East Side of Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. I watched when I was a kid. Did you used to watch LA Law as a kid? Yeah. 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 
Yeah, I and wanted I to be. Wait, Arnie. I, you, I didn't think you were old enough for L.A. Law. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I wanted to be Arnie Becker from L.A. Law Court. Yeah. I wanted to be one of those lawyers who got up in front of jurors and captivated them and made all this money and had all these beautiful women around them. I said I wanted to be that guy, and my dad said. Yeah, you should be that guy. You should go to law school, but you got to get good grades, which somehow I eked out decent enough grades. I got an Army ROTC scholarship. I went to Miami of Ohio, ROTC, went to Iraq after that, came back, worked at a couple big law firms. Did you, were in you in action? I was, yeah, I was there uh, for a year in 2003. Yeah. Wow. wow. What was that like? Yeah. It was uh, hot. It was <laughs> hot. It was, yeah, it was it was cool because that's what you um, talked to your therapist about how hot it yeah, was. Yeah. <laughs> among, among among the things I talked to her about, yeah, it was a great. Ex- I was a total juvenile delinquent in high school, and only slightly less so in college. And I viewed going to the army as a way to get some much discipline. needed discipline. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that it gave me the di- it gave me some discipline, but it would, what right, it yeah. gave me more than anything was responsibility over other human lives. I always tell people, man, if you have the ability to hire a vet, hire a vet, because that's a person who was given more responsibility than they knew how to handle at an earlier age than anyone else would in, in the private sector, right? Yeah. So I was like 20, I was in my 20s and I was leading convoys with, you know, 160 soldiers in the convoy. I was like 27 years old. And, there, you know, and and I wasn't ready, but the army did a decent job telling me what I needed to know to make good decisions. And you learn bureaucracy because the army is the yeah, biggest Yeah, so how bureaucracy. much did this help you being an entrepreneur years later? Yeah, we have, to this day, right now, we have all hands meetings every Tuesday, which is a direct correlation to the all hands platoon meeting we had 20 years ago, right? The format of that meeting still is consistent. I mean, there's there's lessons of leadership that I acquired in the military that as an entrepreneur, how about, I mean, you've, you've, th- I'm sure you've dealt with this, John, working with people who are older than you is a, is a skill, yeah. right? Have, cause, cause the reporting structure, you know, you're automatically assuming that you're reporting to somebody who's older than you and who has a, more experience than you. And when that gets flipped, it, it's a, it's a different psychological dynamic that you have to know how to navigate. Right. And usually, and I failed at it miserably before I got decent at it. You know, that's interesting that you say that because there's a, a thing I just read that close to it was 40 percent a couple of years ago. And, and obviously it's a little higher today, but uh, 40, 45 percent employees work for someone younger than them because of the, yeah. our reliance on the digital revolution and all that, which is difficult. Right. So. So, yeah, that's a that's a, a, a important skill set. Yeah. Yeah. It requires, I think it requires a lot of emotional intelligence. Yeah. A lot. Right. Yeah. That's exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly what the article is about that you can't microwave emotional intelligence. I mean, you can't fake. Right. Right. Well, and, and so, and I I mean, I remember there was a time, gosh, I, I, I thought my soldiers were going to just like frag me, just kill me because I was micromanaging the shit out of them. Can I swear on your podcast? Yeah. 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 Um, And my first sergeant came to me and said, Lieutenant, you're a really great leader, but they're going to kill you if you keep micromanaging them the way you are. And that was my first lesson in how to be a good leader. And and you in, in, in terms of how much control is the right amount of control. Right. Um, con- you know, trying to control the objective is one thing. Trying to control how they do their job is a, a great way to piss people off. And so learning that in your 20s is huge, huge. I still don't know that I got it, that I have that I, I have it right even now, but I'm glad that I got those lessons. Well, you know, what, uh, let me ask you this, because I've always said that every employer or, you know, a, 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 every human being should work in two industries, you know, yeah. 
regardless of where they end up. And it, one would be hospitality. I think, you know, working in that environment, the crazy chaos, restaurants, serving, you know, uh, that. And then sales in some sort. I think those are two just invaluable yeah. skill sets. But as you're saying this, I also feel like serving, right, would be a val- would you Would you agree that that? You know that that would be a critical skill set that people should could have experience. I, I mean, I can say that I had a really positive experience. That's great. Military. Especially you serve you serve during you know I mean you know yeah. wartime. Yeah, yeah. We could talk about just that all day, John. It was a, it was a great lesson in leadership in stress management, both my own my own stress and theirs stoicism, right? What you can control from the things you can't control and just dealing with responsibility. I mean, I remember, and again, 27 years old and I had moms of my soldiers as we were leaving saying, you have to bring my son home. Mm. You have to bring him home in one piece, exactly the way he looks right now. Right. And just the weight of that responsibility was like, I I just, uh, you know, it's like uh, it's like when you have a kid, right? You have a kid, and you're like, okay, life is no longer just about me. Yeah, I am now here for that little dude, right? Yeah, same thing, same thing. Now I was like, I went from just think, worrying about myself and how to take care of my own needs to okay, I've got 160 soldiers here that are depending on me to come home, and they've got wives, they've got kids, they've got moms. It was an overwhelmingly meaningful experience for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, that's really cool. Yeah. So now you have a a booming practice, a law firm. So I want to visit there and I, I really want to get to your new book. But uh um so I wrote an, a blog that uh, got a lot of eyeballs uh, you know because of the title why your lawyer, doctor and accountant suck at service. Mm. <laughs> So here's my take, and, and obviously I'm broad stroking, but this will get me to what what makes Gertzberg Law uh, Lakata unique, and, and and that's where I'm going with this. But my take, and, and tell me where I have it right and wrong, is those three, and, and there's others, IT, but the, you know, lawyers, doctors, accountants. There's such an absorbent amount of you know schooling right to get into and then once you you get your 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 uh, license to practice it's not like the the learning ends right it's constantly changing you constantly have to be updating and to me there's 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 not a lot of room and time in it to learn about the client experience yeah and and i think sometimes and listen you know consultants fall into that category too we could be guilty of you know, I'm brilliant at my craft at, at law or or uh, a finance or you know whatever it is, and we forget that there's a lot of smart people out there that do what we do. Yeah, and you know, so like the example I give is the twenty five thousand dollar tax loophole my accountant saved me uh, on you know my returns. While I appreciate that, I'm pretty sure any you know any accountant, and I don't mean any accountant, but any accountant I would choose would know that same tax loophole. So his yeah. financial brilliance is a commodity on its own. So what do I got right and what do I got wrong? Broad stroking lawyers. So I thought your best point in that blog was ego, right? Lawyers are notorious for narcissism, right? For just have they think that they are God. I went to law school. I have superior intellect over the person in the room with me. They're coming to me. They're writing me a fat check to get out, get them out of a big problem, right? A problem that's keeping them up at night, a problem that is probably threatening not only their peace of mind, but their, their company, their family, whatever, right? So here I am, super lawyer, here to get them out of their problem. Your point about ego is dead on. John, it gets in the way of them empathizing, of them getting beyond the technical solution and really like just connecting. So one of our four core values is connection at this law firm, because we have to remember at all times that there's a ton, number one, that there's a ton of lawyers out there that are decent or really good. Yeah. And we've got really good lawyers, but 
there's a lot of really good lawyers out there. There's a much smaller number of them that can check their ego at the door, that can make the client feel, this is this is a, uh, a John DeJulius uh, concept, make them feel like they're the most important person in the room, right? Yeah. Not a lot of lawyers know how to do that. Yeah. They let their ego get in the way. And so I so I agree with your with your premise, right? We yeah. generally, and I think accounts and doctors probably suffer from the same ego issues, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like So you, how, do, you, how how have you built your law firm? Because I I I I yeah. I've been there. I I I've worked with you. You've you've worked with uh, our companies and your reputation. How have you consciously, intentionally tried to be more than the the the, the typical? Yeah. So by making connection one of our core values, it, it's it's a pillar. It's one of the legs of the stool, right? Like we talk hey, about here's it. Here's the thing. Enron, one of their core value is integrity, right? So we can all have, you know, that, that's true. It really is true. So how do you how do you make an intentional? How do you make the receptionist? How do you make the 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 newest junior lawyer? buy into that and, and keep it top of mind awareness? I think the first and, and the, the the most prominent way that we do it is by really understanding the client. We ask them why a lot. We understand what their real interests are. Do you ever read the book, Getting to Yes? Yes. Fisher and Yuri, right? Yeah. The problem with most negotiations, right? And and most of what we do is negotiate, right? right? Whether it's litigation or an M&A transaction, most of what lawyers do is attempt to influence somebody else, right? You and, and there's back and forth, so it's negotiation. What I love about getting to yes, what we do a lot here and which really brings out the connection, the empathy, those soft skills we're talking about is you have to know not just what your client tells you they want, you have to know what is motivating them. What's underneath that want or need, right? What is the interest? If you don't know that at a, at a really deep emotional level, then what you're doing is positional negotiation, right? And that, that that's where you put a stake in the ground, say, this is what I want, and I'm not budging until I get it or something close to it. Well, the other side's doing the same thing. They're positioning themselves too, right? So that creates protracted negotiations. It usually ends up with both parties being pissed off because they're not getting the thing that they're claiming they want. So everyone's unhappy. Everyone's paying more money. Interest-based negotiations um, where you aren't just protecting the real estate that they're staking their, their claim to. You're protecting the real interests. The real interests are usually security, right? Often it's their day in court. They just want, if they've been wronged, they want their opportunity for the other side to really hear them, right? And understand them. Not necessarily in a courtroom. It could be in a room where the other side is sitting there and listening, right? That could be the underlying interest because until then, no one's listening to them. So it's often security, control. They want some control over the situation. It's often a fear. Right. I mean, so there's a lot of emotional intelligence that really comes to play in negotiation and in empathically connecting with the client in more than just that technical, hard skill, ego driven kind of a way. You bring up a really good point that I found myself guilty of is that, the, uh, you know, uh, research for uh, one of my books, it said it's a doctors typically interrupt their patients within 18 seconds. Mm. And, you know, you go into it and, and, and everyone could figure out why the, the two answers I get, and they're both right. Well, they're booked too heavily, but the the real one is that, you know, you go into a doctor's office, you said, listen, doc, I've been running, you know, started running every day and my knee's swollen and it aches and he, he cuts you off or she cuts you off and says, all right, stay off it. I'm going to write you anti but you know, and, and why? Because there's very few things we, you know, a, a patient's brought to that doctor they haven't heard a million times, right? And so then I start thinking about myself when people come up to me after I speak or, you know, ask me about customer experience. I've never had someone bring a, a, a situation to me that I'm like, wow, I've never heard that before, right? You know, yeah. John, I'm having a problem getting, you know, my, my, my whole team to buy in, getting, you know, this, that, whatever. And I cut you off because I'm so excited because I know where you're going and I have a solution. But to your point, people want to be heard. 
Yeah. And they want to transfer the burden from them onto the so-called expert or, or the actual expert. And, you know, and, and they don't want to be cut off. They don't want to feel like you've heard it a hundred times before. And that was really, that was very hard for me because I was so enthusiastic and maybe impatient to, yeah. dude, I know where you're going with this. Let me give you the answer. And, and so, like, I, I really liked what you said there about that. They, they want to be heard, even though you know where they're going with the story, probably. That 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 doesn't do that. You know, that getting it off their chest and transferring that burden is such a critical piece of the listening and, and being a, a, an expert. Was there a point in time in your life when you realized that if I could just stay present and keep my mouth closed, right? that they will talk more, they will appreciate this interaction more. And my only job is to create enough space for them to fill it with whatever emotion, whatever needs they have. Like, did, did uh, you- I, that? I mean, I, I, I still struggle with that, but you're right. Uh, insatiable curiosity, again, I didn't create this. I got it from some you know book or study, but is if you ask a question and don't ask, three to four follow-up questions, odds are you weren't listening, right? I may have just been teeing it up because I want to talk about like, like Alex, you know, how was your weekend, right? And as soon as you, I, I really want to tell you about mine, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and so like, yeah, you're, you're so right. And, and this is something that, you know, is it okay to make this about me? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is something I, I was so proud of, Alex, and I'm so embarrassed today is there, 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 I had an expression that all my staff could say, finish this, is don't build me a clock when I, I want to know what time it is. And basically what I was telling everyone, and I was so proud I had this reputation, is if you can't say it in five or less words, you know, don't come to me. And like right. I, 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 that was like a badge of honor. I thought that was cool. And yeah. today I am, I am like hideously embarrassed that that's, you know, who I was like, you know, I, I would say, Alex, you're building me a clock, but, you know, what is it that you want here? You want the day off? You can have the day off. Right. But you wanted to tell yeah. me there was your sister's wedding and, you know, it's in, you know, Syracuse and, you know, I, I didn't have time for that frivolous yeah. stuff, which is, 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 like I said, it's so embarrassing. I'll, I'll, I'll tell your listeners of, uh, an interesting story about you. When you came over to do my podcast in my law firm, this must have been like five, six years ago. I was in a meeting in the conference room and you walked in and you were and you sat down and my receptionist was talking to you. And you were probably talking to her for like like four minutes, I bet. I came out, I got done with my meeting. I said, Hey John, come on in. You came in and you proceeded to tell me more about my receptionist than I knew. Right. You knew. And and it, what I later learned from you is that you've got a trick, which I now have adopted. And the <laughs> trick is Ford, right? Ford. Yep. Family, occupation, uh, uh, Dia's dreams is our relationship. Recreation. Recreation. Ah, right. Right. Man, I couldn't believe it. And then and then later on or no, the next day she came in and she's like, that dude was awesome. I felt so good. That's why she always puts my calls through to you. And, you know, I get appointments whenever I want. She's no gatekeeper to me, man. I know I know uh, who to, who's bread and butter. <laughs> no, but that is such a, I mean, that goes right to what we're talking about, right? right. Is just connecting with the other side. It's not, it's not just transactional. You're not just there just to get to the other side and, and have them write you a check. You are there to connect with them like a circuit. Right. There's a there's a positive and there's a negative and then there's electricity in the middle when they connect. You, you, you did a great job with that. That really taught me something. Well, you're, I mean, you're right doing it. something special and it's not just you. You know, you got a, a large team that's doing great. But I really want to talk about to you today is, is your new book, The Lawsuit Free Company, which presents a, a you know, a unique approach to protecting one's business. You know, what inspired you to write it and, and tell us about it? Yeah. Where I left off in the story, I, I came back from Iraq. I went to work for a couple large firms here in, in Cleveland, and then I went in-house. I became an in-house general counsel to a large telecom company. I was there for eight years, and I didn't know anything about telecom law. 
and I had to keep this company out of trouble. And at some point in my journey there, I realized that I was creating this audit system, this legal audit system there, and everything fell into these six categories. And my this audit system that I created recognized that there's only six plaintiffs who can sue a business, customers, vendors, employees, shareholders, the government, competitors. That's it. There's no seventh plaintiff. And that was like... 17 years ago, and I still haven't found a seventh plaintiff. Say, say um, the six again. Customers, vendors, employees, shareholders, the government, and competitors. Okay. Well, those are the six plaintiffs who can sue a business. Okay. So that's where this book, that the week of December 18th, it's coming out. It's available on, on uh, pre-order right now on Amazon. But it's been about 17 years in the making. From when we started building out this audit system at Broadvox, and then I started my own firm, we started doing it there for clients of every industry of any size. And it basically turns the tables on how the attorney-client relationship traditionally goes, which is business owner calls their lawyer when there's a summons in the mail, when there's a cease and desist letter that just came in. When someone gets in trouble, when there's a problem, right? It's reactive. The problem with that is you're already in it. So it's going to be expensive. It's going to be public. You're going to be in this litigation casino where, you know, the longer you stay, the longer you pay. Um, and you don't, you can't get out until they let you out, right? And you're and and if you solve that problem, you solve that one problem. You're not solving all the other ones that are that are lurking there. Cover My Six, which we we lay out in this book in a way that makes it really easy for business owners to implement themselves and work with their attorney to implement some of the harder stuff. It helps them holistically build this like six-sided fort around their business. If you know that there's only six people who can sue you, then you reverse engineer what they can sue you for, and then you turn that into defenses to those claims. And that's what we teach clients how to do. You go from reactive to proactive. And and so cover my six is kind of the the, the thesis, the lawsuit free company. Correct. And is that yeah. realistic to to be a lawsuit free company, you think? I mean, obviously it's a title um, book. Yeah. Yeah. So so the answer is yes. Anyone with 250 bucks in Cuyahoga County can file a lawsuit, right? Anyone. And that's probably true in most other counties across America. So it can't prevent a frivolous lawsuit from being filed, but it, it will ward off a lot of them. And those that get through will make it much easier to eliminate early. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you the low-hanging fruit that yeah. we teach every, every client of ours, every Cover My Six client, anyone who comes in and asks us to look at their contracts their, their employee handbooks, a settlement agreement, whatever. Low-hanging fruit, John. You put into every one of those contracts what we call a five-step waterfall dispute resolution provision, okay? A waterfall dispute resolution provision. And it goes into every document that you have somebody sign, and it says, before you, my customer, can sue me, uh, my company, you have to go through these five steps. You have to give me written notice of your beef. You have to wait 30 days so that I can solve it on my own. If that fails, we will have a face-to-face -face meeting in my conference room to address your beef. If that fails, we're going to go to a confidential mediation. And if that fails, we're going to go to a confidential, expedited, expert-led arbitration. Five steps. John, you go through those five steps. Nobody's going to a courtroom. So as an okay? entrepreneur, I am I am building that into my contracts with my vendors. Yes. Employee con uh, whatever we what, yes. what, employ. What would we call it for the employee? Just you know your employment agreements, your non disclosure agreements, your non competes, non solicitations. Your employee handbook should have one. Does it probably doesn't apply to the government, right? They're not going to sign that, are they? The government is not going to sign, that, right? <laughs> but. The government is one of only six plaintiffs, and you're more likely to be sued by a disgruntled employee, mm -hmm. right, or a disgruntled customer than you are by the government. Yeah. So you want 
a lot of the cover my six methodology is based on the 80 20 method right it's impossible to, pro to to protect you from every potential violation of every law and regulation out there and we don't try to or pretend to we look at the 20 30 percent that are going to be responsible for 70 80 90 percent of your liability right right and we knock them out. And, and so that dispute resolution clause will address five of the six plaintiffs, potentially, potentially. Yeah. So, And that's what, and who's this book for? Uh, obviously entrepreneurs, but should their leaders yeah. be reading it? Yes. So the CEO, the COO, the vice president of human relations, HR, definitely entrepreneurs and owners. And it's also good for lawyers. Lawyers who don't typically create these kinds of um, structures for their for their clients. Yeah, I mean, it's it's anyone. It, it's really any good decision maker. Yeah, or, you know, or, and, and listen, the the problem out there, and 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 we just wrote about this is that is the majority of of managers, leaders, whatever you want to call. It, I'm not talking senior executives. I'm talking about someone you just made. You know, the the manager of the GM of you know whatever didn't you know necessarily graduate with an MBA and, and, and didn't have the formal training. They they might have been the best of the team we had and we needed someone to run it. Yeah. But that's where you really get put in harm's way, right? Because they could say something, do something inappropriate and leave you uh, vulnerable. So I would almost feel like this should be, you know, uh, at least a portion, you tell me, uh, uh, chapters needs to be training on your newest leaders as well. So they're not creating, you know, exposure and liability uh, on top of what either the, my cover my six is doing. Right. Well, so the book is also a, so yes, it is a training manual. It is a playbook, but it's also a reference book. So the second half of the book is all checklists and contract templates and that that's what I was gonna ask you. so these things that you said that i build into my employment agreement and, and that these yeah. i get it i can get it from the book those are the appendices in the book that's right Great. they were written by our lawyers yeah so you know it's uh it's no i think this is a game changer and i know you have a tremendous momentum with this do you have any success stories case studies that you can share yeah so so the best one my favorite one to tell and I, we, we did a cover my six audit for an online travel agency and they were a tech company. And one of the questions we ask in the cover my six process, we talk about it in the book is your lawyer should review your insurance policy because when you get sued, you're going to call two people. You're going to call your lawyer and you're going to call your insurance agent to file a claim. We found out that this company, this client of ours had a cybersecurity policy of like $50,000. And this was a, a, a tech company. And we, we were like, stop what we're doing. We're not going to go, the audit is not going to continue. We're going to fire your insurance agent and you're going to max out your cyber coverage, right? Because you're a tech company, you're an e-commerce company. It, 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 they maxed it out. It was, it was like 5 million in coverage for a company their size. And John, within 90 days, they got hacked. 90 days later, they got hacked by this hacktivist group from like Romania, right? And they did a ransomware attack. They got all of the credit cards out of their uh, system. They were going to post them onto the dark web unless they got the ransomware. And because they had the coverage, $50,000, they would have had to shut their doors. Their insurance carrier got these crack former FBI forensic investigators to come in, start locking down all their data and negotiating with these hacktivist groups. That's my favorite story because it's one of those unconventional things. You're, you're a business owner. You go to your insurance agent for insurance and your lawyer for a lawyer stuff when you get in trouble. Here, this these guys were uh, savvy enough to come to us proactively. They knew that they had problems, but they didn't know where. And we basically mined the insurance issue before we excavated anything else and nipped that in the bud and it ended up saving their company. Wow. That's huge. That, that That's huge. So, so what's the most important advice listeners should have regarding legal protection and risk management besides they got to pick up a copy of uh, the lawsuit free company, which we're going to share in our show notes. 
the link to Amazon as well as covermy6.com and how to follow uh, you on LinkedIn and your blog. But uh, what, yeah. what's the what's the best uh, advice you give a- any entrepreneur? Yeah, here it is. Look, even when my lawyers totally knock it out of the park for our client, right? If it's in litigation, even when we knock it out of the park, the client's pissed because they just went through 18 months of courtroom time and effort and energy and money, and it sucks, right? There's really only one way to avoid that, and that is to get proactive. If you had an in-house general counsel, if you're a CEO and you had a general counsel sitting next door to you, you'd be talking to them about getting rid of all of your legal problems. Just because you're not a $100 million company doesn't mean you don't need to have that conversation with your lawyer. This book will teach you how to have that conversation with your lawyer and get really proactive because litigation sucks. It's no fun. No, no, no. And you're right. And we we avoid it because we're thinking every time we pick up the phone, that's going to cost us. That's a billable hour. But, you know, it, it, it like 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 insurance, the alternative is, is going to be a lot more expensive. Yes. And it's unpredictable. Uh, and it's public and it's distracting. Man, I won't ask you if you've ever been in it, but I can tell you that when my clients are in litigation, they come in here every time totally stressed out. And they tell me about how they go home. And while they're playing with their kids, they're thinking about the deposition that they had to give that week or about trial coming up or about their legal bills. And it's hard to maintain your serenity when you're litigating. Yeah. Um, So get it on the front end. Yeah. That anxiety, it it just eats away at you. Like it's 24 seven. Yeah. Yeah, it's helpful. What emerging trends do you see? You know, the the one I'm concerned with, and and, and it's still in diapers, is the impact of AI. I don't know if that that's yeah. that's anything that that the you, know, you are addressing with your clients, but but what, what's your what's your thought? Whether it's that or, or other emerging trends that we we have to be prepared for. Yeah, AI does not scare me because it is here, and it's it's not. There's no way to, there's no way around it. You're, right. you're, I believe that, you know, we had somebody in here who said, your job won't be replaced by AI. Your job will be replaced by someone, by someone who does. It. Yeah. Who knows right? how to use it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So it's here. I mean, it's a, it's part of our lives at this point. And so, you know, it's like you can try to ignore it, but it's like ignoring gravity. Right. You know, right. it's right. here. You got to you right. know, figure out how to use it. <laughs> There's always these jokers who end up misusing it and they get disbarred. They get their their licenses, their law license taken away. So, you know, there's that when Mr. Miyagi says to the karate kid, um, Daniel, if, Daniel, Daniel. Yeah, he goes, he goes, the crane technique, if used properly, there's no defense. Right. Like that's it to me. That's AI. Right. If you use it properly. If you use it properly, it will make you a lot more effective. If you misuse it or ignore it, you're just going to get left behind. Right, right. Um, and and I will say that the law firms that are using it effectively are saving their clients a lot of money, right? Because what used to take a lawyer 10 hours to do, a, a really good AI software can now do in 10 minutes. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Now the lawyer is just checking the work and making sure it's accurate. But and then and then there's you do EOS. You guys do EOS over there, right? Yes. Don't you? Yeah. yeah. So G, Gino Wickman's got this great quote. It, it's something about commoditize the repetitive so that you can humanize the exceptional or something like that, right? Anything that is anything that can be done repetitively, put it into this bucket of low cost whether it's VAs or AI or just that now becomes process, right? Process. Put that repetitive stuff in there so that you can really humanize and exceptionalize what is not repetitive. And it's not a perfect analogy, but you know, it does go back to that part of the conversation we had earlier where you really have to connect and, and work on those soft skills and the more space you can create to do that, the better. And and AI is just one way to do that, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I butchered that quote. Here, I am speaking it. to Alex Gertzberg, managing partner of Gertzberg Lakata Law Firm and author of the soon-to-be best-selling book, 
the Lawsuit Free Company, which we'll have on our show notes, how you can order it. A couple more questions here, Alex. Listen, you are a father, a uh, you have a significant other, you are a highly successful entrepreneur of multiple businesses. You know, I know your health and personal life are important to you. You know, how do you how do you stay fresh and motivated with professional development? You know, what's your best practice? Mm. Oh man. All right. I'm going to go and then I want to hear your answer. Oh, by the way, I I, I did butcher that quote. It was systemize the predictable so you can humanize the exceptional. That was the genius. Systematize the predictable so you can humanize the the exceptional. Exceptional. All right. Good. Exceptional. Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm so glad you asked that because I'm always curious about where your game is in this area. Okay. So my meditation game is at an all time high. I can't right believe now. that I, you told me that before we got on, yeah. and, and I, that, that's that yeah. you're giving me hope that if you can meditate, it, it, it's possible. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and, and I got a teacher. I got a meditation teacher. I, I think about it constantly. I'm reading about it. I'm just learning. I mean, you and I are optimizers, right? And to me, I knew that meditation was a worthwhile endeavor, but I didn't think my ADD mind would allow me to sit still for more than a minute. So I started with a minute and then I went to two and then I went to three and then I really started studying it and talking to people about it. I read this great book this summer called The Science of Enlightenment by Shinzen Young and that totally changed my game. So I can tell when I'm having a really grounded, stable, confident day by whether I meditated that day. And you know? so, so do you do uh, this, you know, uh, regularly every morning, yeah. multiple times a day? Every morning for 30 minutes. And I try to squeeze in a second one in the afternoon for 15 to 30 if I can. That's unusual. But yeah, my meditation practice is is probably the biggest booster, pr- like productivity, effectiveness, sanity, serenity booster that I've got right now. You and I, we talked about you know, peptides and working out and eating well. I mean, those are, I'm pretty proud of. And I I try to learn something new every day too. So I start my mornings with the Kindle and I I get Libby, I got script, I got all these different things that I get eBooks from. And I try to learn something new every single day. And you do, you do make it purely about business or a wide range of topics? Yeah. Great question. It's usually business. But it's a lot. It's also a lot of like relationship stuff. You know, I've got this coach, Dan Sullivan, strategic coach. Yeah. And he talks about life really being brought down to four or five freedoms. What entrepreneurs really want more than anything is freedom, right? Because we don't like being told what to do. We want the free, we want freedom of money, time, relationships, purpose, and health, right? So I can fit most learning into one of those five things. Right? How can I optimize my health? How can I optimize my relationships, my time, my money, my purpose? Yeah, I, I, I just, I do, I do some reading every day, and I try to, and I keep a journal. What new thing did I learn today? All right, you go, you go. Where are you at the top of your game these days, John? I, I don't know if I am. I, you know, I, 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 it's, it's some of it's similar, but I've gotten stale. But, but yeah, I, I try to read. My goal is to read fifteen minutes a day which sometimes will turn into an hour and sometimes it's cut it off at 15. And it sounds like we're we're similar. I try not to read, like if I read one book, you know, and let's say it takes me a month. The problem with that is I'm better, more aware, more cognizant of whatever I'm reading that day, you know, motivation, business building, you know, customer experience, whatever that is. But then I start suffering in the four or five other areas. So what I try to do is visit all of those, maybe for five minutes, you yeah. know, be a better father, you know, be better in relationships, better at business, be- better at motivation. I try to do that, but I do it in different ways. I mean, it could be, it could be audio, it could be video. You know, I, I call it consuming. And, and, and I, you know, I joke that uh, I'm the uh, Joey Chestnuts you know, Joey Chestnuts is a hot dog eating guy. Yeah. The, the 15 time world champ. Right. No, but yeah. And I try to do that. I, obviously on I, I, my uh, niche customer and employee experience, but, but on, on other things and whether that, that could be TikTok, YouTube videos, 
you know, I, but I, but I use downtime quite well, whether it, driving, flying, even grocery shopping, you know, I'll listen to a podcast and, and all that adds up per yeah. week to digesting, nailing a, a, a good podcast. I think there's a lot more downtime than we realize. And we say, well, I, I don't have time at the end of the day. Well, you had time throughout the day that, that you might have. And, but, and, then, and then I'll go a different way for a little bit. What I found is like, you know, if you go for a run or, or, or whatever and not listen to anything. Mm. And while sometimes that's, that's a scary feeling, what I have found is when I get back, I have to run in the house and find a napkin, you know, garbage to write on. Cause I got, I, I got 16 new ideas. Cause when you just kind of, that, that maybe that's the closest I come to meditating that in long showers is when your mind is inactive, the brilliance come to you. And I'm, I'm telling you something you already know. So that, and then just, you know, making sure I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm improving in, in, in all of those, those five areas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I really think it's it's really all about just staying present. And meditation for me is one way to just train my brain to stay present and not wander off. What made you get there? What, what made you say, I have to commit to meditation? Because I'm assuming uh, from personal yeah. experience, you know, I've tried and like, you know, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And then I, I, I say, I'm just not that person. How, how did you break through that? So I went on a couple of retreats over the years. Each time I went, it really reinforced it for me because you're surrounded by other meditators and there's someone who's like a trained professional there who's who you're able to interact with or given talks. Each time I went on a retreat, it really amped up my meditation game. But I've been I've been meditating for over 10, 12 years at this point. Oh my God. I, yeah, I mean, and it, look, I mean, it's one of those things too, John. I'm sure you have this in your life somewhere. I didn't floss my teeth until I was 22 because somebody told me, my dentist said, hey, Alex, go floss your teeth for the next three weeks. And then I defy you to not floss your teeth teeth after that, right? I've been flossing my teeth every day since then because yeah, once you do it, the habit, right? You've got the wiring now. Right. That's what, that, that's what happened with me and meditation is I just did it every day a little bit more and a little deeper and with a little bit more instruction. I use different apps. And at some point, it felt, I felt like I was off if I wasn't meditating. And I mean, I don't know, just there's, there's that saying, su success leaves clues. There's a lot of people that I really admire who know how to stay present, who know how to just be totally mindful, totally in the moment, on demand. And the ones that have said, I needed a little help getting there, always followed it up with, and then I started meditating, hmm. right? That's if I good. needed help, if I need help getting present, meditation is that help for me. It just allows me to really stay 100% in the moment and, and, and observe the majesty of the moment. While my mind is trying to go into the future or into the past, meditation helps me remember that I don't have to do that, that this moment is all the magic I could possibly want, you know? And I give and I and I give that the gift of my presence to the person that I'm with. Yeah. That yeah. Is. I love that. I love that. No, you got me intrigued. I'm 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 gonna uh re-explore it. Alex, I know I, I think you have uh your upcoming annual sabbatical coming up. Tell us our listeners what that looks like, what yeah. it does for you, what do you do on it? Yeah, yeah. It, we're we're leaving two weeks, uh, about a week and a half from now for Costa Rica. Three weeks. We go every year anywhere from three to six weeks. We're going to do three weeks there. And then we're going to do another three weeks in in January or February in a, in a different country. But we've been doing this for five years, my, my fiance and I. And traditionally, it's been to someplace in South America. We, we love Cleveland, but man, it's like this all the time in December and January, right? It's gray and overcast. And so in South America, it is summer while it's winter up here. It's the Southern Hemisphere. And it's the same time zones. So you can still, what if, if you need to work, you can work relatively easily. You can connect with your team. And I've Are always any special, felt... Any special rituals you, you try to tackle or or goals when it's over you, you want to accomplish? 
Well, one thing, one thing that it definitely helps me do, and there was a time in my life, John, where I really thought New Year's resolutions were bullshit. It was just an excuse that, you know, just yeah, set goals throughout the year. Why do you need to wait until January, right? Now I, I really get into them. And leaving the country, there's some there's some magic about being able to create some distance between the last year and the now and the next year. And the la- like since we've been doing this, somebody sent me this thing called the annual compass. Some EO member sent this to me. You could probably Google annual compass. It's like 10 pages of questions to reflect on the prior year and set goals on the next year. And it's money. This thing is so cool. It just, it's a, a series of pow- really powerful, insightful questions. So I, so one of the rituals is I will go find a quiet place in a different country while Tiffany takes Milo to, uh, to walk uh, somewhere. And I will just focus on what, like every day, a little bit uh, on what the last year what worked, what didn't work. And I think really big for the next year, this last year, I created a theme for this year. And the theme was go big and let go Mm. and like big, big goals for the year in the, in the business and my personal life. And then what do I need to let go of? What am I holding on to grudges, resentments, relationships that I don't need. So it was a lot of go bigs and a lot of let goes. And now I'm looking back at the last year and I'm like, holy shit, there was a lot of big things, big risks, good, good risks, and a lot of good things I let go of. That's awesome. Alex, what do you want your legacy to be when it's all said and done? You're doing a lot. You're an overachiever and it's easy to get caught up in you know, that, that ladder of success and wake up and, and, and wonder if it was worth it. What, what, what do you want your legacy to be? I think I want it to be that I'm imagining a conversation about Alex Gertzberg after Alex is gone. And I'm hoping it goes something like this. That dude lived authentically and helped a lot of people. That's you know? good. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And you're I, doing that. I, you're doing that. Uh, what would you tell your younger self? Quit stressing. It'll yeah. all be fine. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think about that, Alex, like, like you know, it's, it's similar, right? Like, you're creating drama where it'll all be fine. But then sometimes I think, well, if we didn't have that stress and sense of urgency, maybe we wouldn't have put out the fire. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I know we have the hindsight of, you know, it all works, it's out, but but we made it work out, right? We 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 all hands on deck and we had to put out that fire or, or, or whatever it is or make, you know, sales to pay the rent. I don't know. I think we I think we could still have that. And I think the stress that I'm talking about, yeah, I wouldn't change that part of it. Yeah. I, I would the part I would change if I was talking to my younger self is the part where he is up all night, yeah, worried. Worrying yeah. about what people think of him, worrying about whether people like him, just stressed out about stuff that, that he can't control. You know, I would yeah. definitely still be hard driving. He would still be hard driving and solving those problems. Yeah. Out the fire. Yeah. No, that's great. All right. Alex Gertzberg, author of the new soon to be best-selling book, The Lawsuit Free Company. Alex, I've known you for several years. I don't know how many years it's been known of you longer and i've really enjoyed getting a front row seat to watching you grow into this successful a personal professional person and 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 someone i i call a friend thank you so much for all you're doing my man thanks john that that means a lot to me i really appreciate it thank you all right revolutionaries we'll be back right after this Let's wrap up this week's episode with my mantra of living an extraordinary life so countless others do. Following on the theme of my opening dialogue to this episode, the Daymaker Dopamine, the following stories is one of my favorite that happened two decades ago at the first business I opened and still own today, John Roberts Spa. It really defined the type of above and beyond organization and culture I want every employee that works for me to deliver. So a client a couple of decades ago shared a story about the time she walked in to one of our salon locations for a one o'clock uh, manicure appointment. The receptionist who greeted her said to her, we have been trying to contact you all morning. 
your nail technician who was supposed to give you your appointment went home sick. The client said she responded to the receptionist with, you had better find me someone who can do my nails because I have an important meeting this afternoon and my nails look horrible. I don't care who it is, but you got to better find me someone. So that receptionist ran around the salon and a few moments later came back and returned to the client and said, I apologize. Unfortunately, all our nail technicians are book solid. I can't find anyone here that can give you your manicure. However, I called the salon that's a few doors down from us, a different salon, and they have an opening right now. So I booked and paid for a manicure with them. The client was shocked. She was ecstatic, couldn't believe that we booked and paid for her manicure with another salon. I love that story. That is exactly the type of culture we want all our employees to do. As I like to say to all of our employees, you will never get in trouble for something you do for the customer. You will only get in trouble for something you don't do. Thanks for joining us, revolutionaries, for this week's episode of the Customer Service Revolution Podcast.